All right, guys, so here it is, the float wheel. And this is actually not mine, but instead this is a board that uh, somebody generously let me use for a few weeks. He ordered two and gave me one, so thank you for that. And uh, we're going to just take it on a ride. And I'm not going to do a normal review because there's plenty of review videos of this already or there's uh, plenty in the works, so you don't really need me to give you a review. Uh, I'm, instead, I want to focus on some of the issues and how we can fix them. And um, yeah, I'm going to do this while I'm riding one of my favorite trails here. And I'm going to record the screen so you can see the live data, you can see the power consumption motor currents, battery currents, and so on. And uh, you can see the voltage too, and the exceptionally low voltage sag. And um, yeah, so enjoy. So here is a list of the known float wheel issues. I'm going to separate them into four categories. The first one being issues that we can fix by just changing firmware, second one would be fixable but requires hardware modifications the third one would be a category where it's fixable but only by Tony the last category is basically issues that aren't easily fixable so let's start with the easy ones the ones that we can fix ourselves first the board cannot be powered on while it's charging that is very annoying and unusual for VESCs. I know for, I mean, for myself, this is the very first thing I want to address so that I can at least see where the board's at while it is charging. The next one is the control of the lights isn't really ideal with that button. Uh, there isn't enough options and it can't be turned off. So that's something that we have a couple of guys that are working on that already and uh, that should address all the, the light issues that or the complaints that people have about it. All right, so this uphill right here is a challenge for any XR. For the GT, you can make it up, but uh, slowly. Whereas here, we can still accelerate on the uphills. I can pump the board. I can... And I'm riding this with pretty much default settings, I think. I didn't really change much at all yet. So, ATR is fairly mild. But I love the big tire. It's like almost half an inch bigger than standard XR tire or the bigger XR tires. And uh, not quite as big as the seven inch Burris, but pretty close. All right, so there is this gigantic hill here that uh, is a big challenge for any board and you can't make it up without upping the ATR but I'm gonna skip that one for later I know it can make it up but I don't want to mess with ATR settings right now just keep going so here's a single track nice little drop off on the side Also, this trail overheated every one of my fun wheels in the beginning. Um, the XR just barely made it without overheating. But as you can see here, motor, what are the temps? Oh my God, we're not even at 40 Celsius yet. So temperature is really not an issue. Controller a little warmer than the motor. Oh, 
The next one is an odd one. Um, we have a lot of boards out there that have a odometer value that is non-zero when they started, I think something like 275 kilometers. And it turns out that Tony copied the memory of his one wheel or of his prototype float wheel onto all the first production models. And so they all start off at 275 kilometers equivalent mileage and um, we weren't able to change that back and there's a trivial reason for it and we can fix that uh, on my board I've already fixed that actually and the last one is that the buzzer is not very useful right now it buzzes for a few strange reasons but it doesn't actually serve as a buzzer that we are used to in the in our DIY VESC boards so that's something we are also working on. We will be able to use the buzzer that's on the LCM module as a regular float package buzzer. Now the next category is issues that are fixable with hardware modifications. Man, I forgot to start Hermes. First one is again buzzer related. Yes, I like my buzzer. The buzzer is too quiet. Um, apparently there is a some resistors in that circuit that reduce the uh, the output of the buzzer so we should be able to get it up to 85 decibels which um, is inside a housing is still not super loud but it's good enough that's that's what I've been using and it satisfies our needs so hopefully it's an easy mod on the LCM board yeah but yeah not a big issue some people don't care about the buzzer, we have the apps and so on. The next one is uh, apparently some Bluetooth modules are sometimes weak and disconnect. Slant trails. Uh, personally, the board that I'm riding right now, the Bluetooth is perfect, it never disconnects, it is rock solid, I can walk away from the board for like at least 10 feet or so and it stays connected so I'm perfectly happy with the Bluetooth module but apparently for a few people um, there are either loose antenna wires or something about insulation that uh, Tony is addressing so that should be a fairly easy fix for most people and now the biggest issue it's probably in my opinion, the single biggest problem that the float wheel has, and that is the BMS. The BMS is a so-called dumb BMS. It's, it doesn't report cell voltages. It uh, doesn't have a Bluetooth <laughs> capability or anything like that. But that's not even the worst of it. The worst of it is that the BMS is set up as a charge and discharge BMS. And that is just unacceptable because it essentially has the ability to shut you down at any moment without notice. And because it doesn't communicate with the VESC, it cannot give it a heads up that there is an issue, like if a cell voltage is low, if a cell is somehow acting up, or if you're going downhill and a single cell goes above 4.25 volts, it will shut down the power to the VESC, which means you go down. Um, and there's simply no reason for it. I understand why Tony did it. Pretty much when you're producing a PEV, uh, it is difficult to sell a product that doesn't have the discharge protection. Right. So ignorant users can't just ignore low battery and keep writing until the battery dies but that I personally don't care about any of that and anybody who's building a DIY one wheel will also wire their BMS for charge only that's best practice the, they do that in the Eastgate world as well and there's simply no reason for us to keep this BMS as a charge and discharge BMS so what we need to do is modify the BMS so that it only is involved in charging and we basically run a wire directly to the controller from the battery that bypasses the BMS when you're riding it. Now, 
the big problem with that is we need one extra wire in the wiring harness and obviously there probably is no extra wire we need one with a certain thickness so what i'm considering doing is at least on my personal board i will sacrifice the rear ah leds and use those two or three wires for the leds and i will turn that into that extra charge wire so that way we have a separate wire for charging and a separate wire for discharge meaning for writing and yeah i really was excited about having a board with lights but i'd rather have a board that does not make me nosedive at random and maybe in future versions tony will ship a wiring harness that includes that extra wire and that way we can have the rear leds and a charge only bms but for now to me that kind of safety issue is much more important than having lights especially if it's just sacrificing the ones in the rear now the next category is some issues that are fixable by tony that some of them are just early early model issues um, production ramp up issues and so on um, first off cracks in plastic most people already know about this it's something that's probably either due to poor design where some sections are very thin plastic and like for example the foot pads and the corners by the tire or due to over torquing or both and uh, also apparently the, the plastic itself Tony was uh, <laughs> he made videos where he was talking about how uh, he was trying to get the plastic to look perfect but he forgot to check for uh, how durable it actually ends up being and now we've got some brittle plastic so be careful with your bumpers until you get a replacement they don't hold up to much abuse the next issue is the stock tire is a bit too big for the board so only low PSI is, uh, is usable if you want to ride higher PSI you have to take off the, the fender base but then you lose some protection of your controller boxes so um, it's something if you put an enduro on or uh, any other six inch tire then you should be fine but the stock tire is almost 300 millimeters in diameter which is a bit on the big side another issue is the foot pads the uh, apparently the, the grip tape is coming off and it's hot on some of the early models uh, but Tony's being great about it, sending out replacement parts, so it should be solved pretty quickly. Also, we've seen some ghosting on some sensors, and others don't reach above 2 volts when you're standing on them. Uh, all those appear to be early model issues. The board that I'm riding right now, by the way, seems perfect. I have zero sensor issues. It engages perfectly. It disengages perfectly. Absolutely no issue with it at all. Um, the last one is uh, is the ESC itself. It's super noisy. It's crazy noisy at low speeds. When you're riding at normal riding speeds, it's no problem. But at low speeds, it is downright embarrassing how loud it is. It sounds janky. And uh, hopefully Tony can address that somehow. I don't even know what it is. Issues with the current sensors on the ESC. So something that should be fixable by Tony in future revisions, but for now we just have to live with it. And uh, apparently not everybody has this issue. Some people report perfectly quiet boards, but in the end of the day, it's not a big issue. Still embarrassing for such a nice product. All right, now the last category, the ones that aren't that easily fixable. First, we've got excessive idle discharge. That means that the uh, battery drains quicker than needed even though the board is turned off. It drains more quickly than any other vest on the market and uh, it might have something to do with the LCM module 
it's really not an issue at all for people that are writing all the time but if you're trying to store your board there is no good way of preventing the board from draining so anyone who lives in a cold place doesn't write it over the winter or if you have an injury and you're out for six to eight weeks make sure that you have a friend ride that board every now and then or, or recharge your board every few weeks but uh, don't leave it over the winter for four or five months and um, expect it to still work when you come back luckily the discharge BMS will prevent it from going from completely destroying the battery but it still does allow the battery to sit below three volts for a long time and that can cause cell imbalancing issues and some people have that right now with the boards that they have received because of the six to eight weeks on the ship so it is a pretty serious issue for the initial setup for the delivery as well as for longer breaks for riding. But for anyone who rides daily, this is a, a non-issue. Or even if you go on a week-long vacation, it's not a big deal. You might end up losing a few volts in the battery and you recharge it and you're good. Now the last one. I have it in the category of not easy to fix, but it kind of looks like Tony actually already addressed it in the newer models. Basically, the first 200 motors that were shipped out were on the slow side, meaning they were really good at torquing up steep hills, but the top speed was not close to what you would be able to get with a GT. So be careful if you're in the first 200 recipients of the motor because your motor is most likely not going to allow you to beat a GT in a speed comparison. That doesn't mean you can't go 20 plus comfortably and still have good margin, but it means that if you hit 30, you're really pushing it and GTs can actually, if they're fully charged, let's talk fully charged board here, a GT can go well above 30 miles an hour and keep you up and you wouldn't nosedive. But a float wheel with the early motors will not let you go more than 30. You will nosedive. So do not try it. Okay. And or if you do, keep a really good look at your duty cycle. If you're above 90, you're pretty much done. Uh, 95 is the physical limit it will basically just hold it there but that means that it'll just slowly nosedive so um, be super careful if you're trying to be speedy the thing about the early motors is that actually for some people top speed is not important and being able to go 20 22 is really more than enough for them and um, so I'm betting that these early motors will be kind of a hot commodity and I bet there's going to be some trading going on with between the early motors and the new motors. Now the new motors, they're not as fast as like a super flux, but they at least match the hypercore speeds so that if you, you take the float wheel with the new motor, you should be able to go faster than on a GT without risking a nosedive. So really, the motor thing may not really be an issue at all, but it's just something to look out for. Um, the best way to test if you have the slow motor or the fast motor is to look at your motor detection values. If you go to motor config, FOC, um, general, then you'll see the motor values of your flux is around 37 then you have the early slow motors if your flux is around 30 31 you have one of the fast ones so that's how you would find out obviously you can also tell if you're going 22 23 miles an hour and you're close to 80 percent duty cycle you probably have the early motor
Now, as I was putting this together, I ran into one more issue that I didn't expect, and that is the Loctite that Tony is using and shipping to you guys. Be very careful with it. It is nothing like blue Loctite. It is almost like an epoxy. It gets really hard and brittle. And you hear that sound? It, that is um, not blue Loctite. If you use a lot of it, especially oh. on the big motor bolts, it will be almost impossible to loosen those bolts. And um, yeah, it doesn't behave anything like blue Loctite. So if I were you, anyone building their new gun wheel, I mean their new float mm. wheel right now, just get some, get your own blue Loctite and use that or use nothing at all. That is better than using the stuff that Tony is giving out because oh that stuff is just JB Weld or something. So um, just right. be mindful of that. Or if you do use it, or you don't want to buy anything, use a tiny amount of it, then you'll be able to, to loosen those bolts. And then the last issue, um, I kind of already broke my first float wheel. I rode it through water, which in hindsight was really stupid. And I'm pretty pissed that I did it. I don't know what the heck I was thinking, but I did it and the board is broken. What happened is I, I opened it all up and uh, there is no water in the front enclosure. Uh, there is no water in the battery enclosure. So that worked out perfectly. But the motor connector, uh, the guy who gave me the board, he received that board with no motor clip. There, is no, there was no metal clip included. But he figured, well, it's holding up pretty well. I mean, there's enough pressure on the cable. You don't really need the clip to hold the connector in place. But I'm guessing that the clip would have helped with preventing water from getting in because it did get in there. And within 10 minutes after going through that creek, the motor wouldn't let me start anymore. So the hall sensors were acting up and motor temperature was reported as zero Celsius. So obviously something was fishy. And yeah, so I was hoping that if it just dried, it would be better and everything would be fixed. But nope. Hall sensors See seem to be broken. I can't detect hall sensors anymore. Right, I don't know if it's on the motor right side yet or on the controller side. I'm guessing probably more likely the controller. If you short the 5 volt and ground, it'll be the controller that breaks, not the motor. But yeah, either way, it's going to suck. And Tony probably already hates me. And now it dies. But yeah, right? that's, that's it is happen. what it is. Yeah. Well, we're going we're gonna to test that right to repair. And uh, we'll see how easy it is to get that thing up and running again. But moral of the story, do not just assume that your board is waterproof. Maybe add some extra silicone around the motor connector. Uh, check that you have all your O-rings before i mean if you live in a wet climate i totally understand wanting to be able to take it into water but if you live in california like me don't be an idiot and ride it through freaking water all right that is all i have see you guys next time